So kia ora tato, no mai, haere mai, and greetings to all, and welcome to this month's EHF live session, our dangerously unambitious plans to prepare for the next pandemic. Edwin Hillary Fellowship, it's a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives, and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa New Zealand. Now, in this session, you're going to hear from Rob Reid, an EHF fellow who's an experienced entrepreneur and in December of 2021 made a presentation at the White House in the US about urgent priorities that can help the world fend off a future devastating pandemic. Now we'll be hearing a shortened version of this talk and there'll be plenty of time for Q&A with Rob during the 60 minute session. So as I've just mentioned, this session is being recorded and it will be up on our website if you want to view it later. Uh, just stay muted while Rob is talking and um, there'll be plenty of time for the Q&A, so you can either put the questions in the chat box or you can just put your hand because it's a nice small group and you can ask those questions directly to Rob. Uh, but firstly, Rob, why don't you tell us about yourself and what mm -hmm. gives you the agency to talk about this big topic today? Great, and just one quick aside, um, the shortened version of the talk is going to less map less directly to the title. I'm actually going to focus on one pretty dangerous research program that's going on right now, but it will tee up uh, Q and A to really go to the broader question: of What can and should we be doing to prevent pandemics right now? So, my background is I'm a, a long-term Silicon Valley tech entrepreneur and investor, and I'm currently in my second uh, stint as a full-time venture capitalist. I'm also a New York Times best-selling science fiction writer, which is an unusual thing for a VC. And I, I base my novels uh, very deeply in present-day scientific knowledge. So, in other words. I try to make them almost as much science as fiction. The scientific component's a big deal. And on top of that, I, I host and produce a deep science podcast in which I interview world-class scientists about their fields and their work. And I'm currently only able to squeeze out a couple episodes a year with it because I've been very busy with my VC stent. And also, actually, more importantly, I've been really intensely focused on the topic that we're about to discuss. But over the years, there's times when I have a lot more time for it. And over the years, I've done all, over 50 of these interviews, each of them, these scientific interviews, uh, each of them reaching you know, 50 to 100,000 people. That's my rough audience. And I spend a good 30 to 35 to 40 hours preparing for each of my, my interviews with you know the guidance of my guests, you know them telling me like if you really want to get deep in the subject, you know watch these university lectures on YouTube, you know read these five scientific papers, etc. And so that's just to say I'm very very deep into science. I'm very pro science, and I'm pretty much the opposite of a luddite wearing a tinfoil hat. So I do not say the following at all lightly, which is that there is a domain of bioengineering in which it's become quite common to conduct stupefyingly reckless experiments. Um, experiments that could easily kill tens or hundreds of millions of people, or even literally, and I'm not exaggerating, billions of people if something goes wrong. And unfortunately, these experiments are happening in places where things routinely go wrong, which is to say in laboratories run by human beings. And so, yeah, I mean, like any lab is a place where either things do or can go routinely wrong. Even at the very top biosecurity levels, there are way too many documented instances of profoundly dangerous pathogens leaking out into the community. Um, many of these lab leaks have killed people, sometimes a lot of people. There are a couple of cases where it's almost certain that lab leaks have caused hundreds of thousands of deaths, and one in which it's quite probable that the death toll runs into the millions. So this does happen a lot more than most of us realize. And given that all labs are prone to leaks, that's historically evident, and there's it's hard to refute it, there's really, in my view, no conceivable moral basis for this new category of wildly dangerous research um, to occur. Research in which profoundly dangerous things that would otherwise not intersect with society, human society, uh, come into labs where they may leak from, or even worse, experiments in which really, really deadly viruses, for the most part, are made vastly more deadly in order to kind of satisfy somebody's curiosity. And unfortunately, it's not for much of a higher purpose than that. Now, someone could make an argument that it's worth 
risking a huge number of lives in order to perhaps save even more lives. But unfortunately, this category of experiments we're about to discuss really do have zero life-saving potential, even though they're usually presented as having hypothetical life-saving benefits. Those benefits are typically so hypothetical that justifying a dangerous experiment with them is essentially an act of deceit. Um, but yet these experiments are happening at an ever-increasing pace. And they're happening for a few reasons. And they're all, frankly, disturbingly uh, trivial. First, there is ego and a reckless thirst for narrow scientific fame, which amounts to careerism, because these experiments often land on the covers of the very top scientific journals, and that can transform an academic career. So the incentives that anybody faces in a high pressure career are there, and we all know people who have probably done something they shouldn't in order to advance their career, but this is that on a profoundly many orders of magnitude basis. There's also a kind of sense of entitlement that comes from cherishing science to a degree that it's placed above all other things. And again, I just need to stress, I am hyper pro-science and I tend to do that to a degree myself, but it gets a little bit crazy when there's an attitude that's kind of like, my field's quest for scientific truth is so noble that society almost has no right to prevent the priesthood that runs this field from going where our curiosity takes us. Um, and there's also a certain lack of humility, which, you know, practicing scientists in this domain literally have to tell themselves, or they would not do these things, that there's never going to be a lab leak on my watch. It just won't happen. And that's probably true in the case of most experiments, and probably true in the case of most scientific careers over the entire course of the career. But we have all these lab leaks. And when we start tangling things, which could be almost omnicidal if they get out, the, the consequences are much higher than if we're actually doing something of value with say smallpox. And I raise smallpox because actually the last person in human history to die of smallpox died because it leaked out of a British lab. And it leaked out of that lab just months after a global decades long campaign to exterminate smallpox had succeeded. And so when you think about how high the security and sensitivity of smallpox must have been at that moment um, in the late seventies and that it got out anyway, you start to appreciate the fact that we can't keep anything in. And so devising things that could be absolutely cataclysmic, there is no justification for that because no way can we guarantee it won't get out. Now, anyway, again, I'll reiterate, I'm saying this is a person with really strong pro-science credentials going back many years. And I'll add, and this gets to Michelle's question of agency here, I'm basing this on an enormous amount of research. Um, basically my public service side is in pandemic resilience. I've never done that for work, but I've done thousands and thousands of hours of research over the past few years. Actually started with a sci-fi book that I was writing, led to a TED talk that I gave about pandemic risk, uh, actually just a few months before COVID. And then when COVID hit, it knocked me into a thousand hour rabbit hole of risk research, which ended up, I, I, I got it out in the world in a variety of ways, uh, including from through some very high tonnage um, you know, podcasts that reach many millions of people. You guys might've heard of Lex Friedman or Sam Harris, both of those and others. And eventually it got to the White House. I came in and as Michelle mentioned, I gave a, a, a actually it was a 250 slide presentation. Don't worry, you're not gonna have to sit through that um, last December. And, you know, so I, it's gotten out there and I've worked very hard on it. So that's kind of the context of this. So with that preamble, I'm now going to share a presentation that I've given once before, the sort of slimmed down version, and about a one US government program that really exemplifies this category of danger. And it's an important example, first of all, because it's a very big program. It has a $125 million budget. And also because it's the product of a democratic open society where a free press and whistleblowers like me are likely to make this sort of thing less likely than in an authoritarian closed society. And on top of that, it's coming out of what you'd think would be one of the most benign arms of the US government. 
so all this is all to say that I think we can confidently say that there's a lot more of this stuff going on out there that we don't know about. If what I'm about to describe comes out of USAID, a little more on that in a second. So even though I'm only going to discuss this one example, we can extrapolate from this to something much bigger. So under the pre presentation, a quick aside, um, I'm not going to be terribly polished in or rehearse because I gave I last gave it, I think, four or five months ago. And tomorrow morning, I'm going in for two hours of orthopedic surgery. So rather than polishing up my delivery over the last, you know, last night or today, I've been frantically tying up every loose end I can think of before I enter seven, several foggy days of painkillers and Netflix. And um, the other thing that's kind of funny, I first gave this for a gathering of life science investors and entrepreneurs in the Bay Area. So there'll be a couple of times when I probably will say, because I'm going to be looking at my notes heavily, I'm going to probably imply that you're all American taxpayers. I, I know that's not the case, or life science people. And, uh, and toward the end, there is much less of a sort of transcendent note than I normally strike and a little bit more of a, oh my God, think of the money you can make vibe because I felt that was the best way to motivate that particular audience. But it, you know, the, the market economy is an incredibly valuable way to marshal resources. So that's why that's in there. Okay, so on to slide one, which is already up there, USAID. This is a $20 billion government, US government arm that mostly distributes America's foreign aid, does a lot of noble things, you know, uh, just, you know, kind of education, agricultural help, all kinds of stuff. But it has some oddball programs that don't fit the main mission. So next slide, um, including a very nascent one, which is called Deep Vision. Next slide, which goes by this bizarre spelling and literally nobody in Washington knows why. I've, I've asked everybody I can. Um, and unless some of us, and there are a few of us who are working on this, stop it. And a spoiler alert, I do think we will. Thank God. And hopefully that is a spoiler. But unless we stop it, Deep Vision will spend the next five years and $125 million doing three things. Next slide. The first is called virus hunting. Deep Vision plans to unearth about 10,000 yet undiscovered viruses in the hope that at least a few of them will be capable of starting devastating pandemics. Next slide. Um, many of the viruses will come from places like isolated bat caves, where, as I kind of mentioned in my preamble, they have essentially zero odds of ever intersecting with human society. Next slide unless Deep Vision hauls them into our cities and suburbs to store them in leaky containers called, next slide, laboratories. Bit of a rerun for my preamble. And I say leaky because I mentioned up, up front, every category of lab of every biosecurity rating leaks a steady flow of things they shouldn't. And we've had deaths from smallpox, SARS, a lot more as a result of lab leaks. And 10,000 new viruses is a lot to add to the global laboratory inventory. Um, it's more than you might think. In fact, Deep Vision, if they proceed, will literally expand the world's archive of mammalian viruses that are not currently known to infect humans by over a thousand percent. Like there are going to be a lot more virus Xs, incalculably more than are currently living in labs. And that's a scary prospect. Next slide. So American uh, tax dollars will be filling up an awful lot of these leaky things over the next five years. Next slide. Now, as it finds these viruses, Deep Vision will perform a process called characterization. Now, this is a complex and expensive suite of experiments that relatively few people can do at scale which will determine which of these 10,000 viruses, probably at least a few, are pandemic grade monsters. In other words, which ones, if they did sneak out of the lab, could kill millions, tens of billions or more people, against which we have no natural defenses, because these will be new labs that we have, viruses that we have cleverly bought, brought from the, the bat cave into human society. 
Um, viruses in this category, pandemic grade novel viruses, are not merely weapons of mass destruction. They're the worst weapons of mass destruction in history, if we find them, because no nuclear weapon could kill like COVID. And COVID is mild compared to the viruses that this program could find. And by the way, these viruses would not just be WMD in the wrong hands, but also in what you might think of as the right hands, like the US Army, not known as a terrorist organization by all in the world, at least. Reasonable minds can, can you know, dis disagree. Next slide, please. And I cite the US Army because they somehow allowed anthrax from its own top or their own top security lab at Fort Detrick to find its way into the office of the Senate majority leader, who's somebody who's in line for the presidency, and several other places, killing five people literally a week after 9-11. So you probably have the most powerful military in history at that moment at its highest level of alert in generations. And it literally couldn't stop that from happening. Its own deadly substance that it created and had under the strongest lock and key from almost killing somebody who was in line for the presidency a few days after 9-11. Um, if that can happen, anything can leak out. And if that can happen, this is going to become relevant, as you'll see in a moment. How do we like the thought of a third-rate university lab with no armed security storing things that are incalculably more dangerous than anthrax or hundreds of labs in dozens and dozens of countries storing such things, some of those countries with brutal and unstable governments. Now, this will be the state of the world if deep vision attains its goals, because as soon as this program starts finding pandemic-grade viruses, next slide, please, Step three is to immediately publish their genomes, their genetic recipes to the entire world. In other words, to respected scientists everywhere, but also, next slide, to Kim Jong-un, ISIS, tomorrow's Columbine kids, et cetera, et cetera, anybody. And at this moment right now, um, the best estimate that's out there is that there's probably about 30,000 people in dozens of countries who already have the tools and skills necessary to assemble these viruses from scratch as soon as Deep Vision makes their blueprints, pardon the pun, go viral. Uh, next slide. And that number, the 30,000 people who would immediately be able to summon you know, a, a, a terrible apocalypse if they wish, will inevitably explode because synthetic biology, like computing, is what is often called an exponential technology. It improves at rates that are completely nonlinear. And that means not only does it get more powerful, and that means not only do the top people get more capable, but most importantly, the number of people in the world who are capable of things that even the top people in the field would find almost impossible today may easily explode by a factor of multiple orders of magnitudes over the cost course of about 10 years. And there's many, many examples of this from the history of computing, which we can talk about in the Q&A if you guys are interested. But this means literally, next slide please, the most astounding feats that only the top practitioners in this field can perform today, next slide, is going to relentlessly and rapidly spread to grad students, next slide, I'm very proud of this multiplying effect, it took me a while, and then to undergrads and then beyond. Huge numbers of people will have the ability to do terrible things with this information if we're dumb enough to gather it and then publish it. So next slide. Now, if like you, it spooks you that nine people out there have nuclear launch codes, imagine 30,000 of us having potential doomsday buttons, and then 300,000, et cetera. Next slide. And I don't say doomsday lightly, 
because there are viruses out there that kill over half the people they infect. That's two orders of magnitude more deadly than COVID. Next slide. Um, something called H5N1 flu is that nasty. It kills about 60% of the people it infects, but it's also barely contagious or we wouldn't be here. I mean, it's so uncontagious that there are entire years that pass with a lot less than 10 cases. Thank God. Um, next slide. But what if deep vision finds something that's equally lethal, but just as contagious as Omicron or something that could be made super contagious with a few genetic edits? That improving technology and tool set are continuing, continually enabling more and more people to make. People who could eventually include folks that we don't usually think of at all in our calculus of, you know, of doomsday because they simply don't have access to atomic weapons. People like, I don't know, humanity loathing eco-terrorists or animal rights maximalists or omnicidal crazies like the ones who shoot up our grade schools and theaters and concerts. More in America, obviously, than New Zealand, but they're out there. Um, next slide. Nothing and certainly not COVID, has prepared us for anything like that. And by that, I mean that, you know, that thing on the two by two matrix in the upper right corner, which has profound lethality and profound contagiousness. Because unless we start making the right investments, and we're gonna talk about those toward the end, the release or escape of a virus like that, and I promise you after this, we're gonna to get to the end of the doom and gloom part. Next slide. The escape of something like that, a pathogen like that, would be a, a civilization canceling event. Because with that thing on the rampage, next slide, there are no frontline workers. Because who's going to take even odds of death or of killing half their families for low wage work? Next slide. And the very few weak workers who do show up would be immediately overwhelmed by panic buying mobs and by stampede on health, health services. At any given moment, and this is at least true of the US, our grocery stores contain maybe two to three weeks of the calories that the country needs. And all of that could be cleared out in just a few hours of looting. Next slide. And meanwhile, with no frontline workers, supply chains everywhere would shut down, along with, now this is a little bit melodramatic, I have to say next slide a few times, so apologies, along with, next slide, most information services. Um, no, wait, along with law enforcement, sorry, next slide, most information services, and the next slide to the totally black slide, and then eventually the power, which would cause a lot of looted food to rot. Let's go ahead two slides, actually, back to this two by two matrix. Um, in light of that, publishing the assembly man manual for something like this, next slide, or the no, I think up one, up one. Yeah. Or even for something relatively benign like COVID, may not strike everyone as an ideal use of public funds. Uh, although Deep Vision has a lot of arguments for all why all of this should really kind of be fairly safe. Um, so next slide. This is where a lot of this is coming from. I've spent a fair amount of time discussing these arguments with people like a guy named uh, Kevin Esfeld, who runs uh, an evolutionary engineering lab at MIT. Subsequently, after Kevin and I got to know each other and discussed this a bunch, he and I ended up recording a two-hour conversation in which I posed basically every devil's advocate position that I could come up with that either of us heard, with, heard of or even could think of in favor of Deep Vision's program. And I'll save you 159 minutes um, although if you want to listen to the interview, um, if you want to saturate in the stuff more than you have already, apologize, it's so dark. It is up there. Um, both Sam Harris and I published it. You can Google it easily. Um, I, those arguments, I, but I will save you the two hours by saying those arguments are ultimately grounded, the arguments in favor of deep vision are ultimately grounded in a certain naivete about how the world outside of academia works in a certain belief that bad guys are so much less intelligent than the good guys who are inventing this field, that you know it almost doesn't matter what they know because the good guys can always outcompete them and, and solve anything that they might you know create or might unleash. 
And sort of these warped incentives in that I mentioned before, this regulatory capture situation, when you have a community that rewards itself with abundant grants and cover stories in prestigious journals for this sort of work. I mean, basically it's a, it's a fox and hen houses situation where the people are in a position to say no to certain categories of experiments are also frankly the people who are on the investigative review board. The people who are in a position to lionize something and make that line of work incredibly desirable by putting it on the cover of Nature or, or Science, the two leading journals in global science, you know, they're also the people who in many cases are part of this community and have the same incentive structures for the community to succeed. Again, a classic case of regulatory capture. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just to mention Sam Harris, as I already said, also posted this thing out there. And subsequent to that, and I'm going to go over this pretty briefly, um, we kind of thought that, that that act of whistleblowing with millions of people hearing it, Sam's got a really big audience, would almost immediately lead to this thing being shut down because it's so crazy. And it was existing in this really narrow obscure corner of the US government and almost nobody who wasn't part of this the scientific community was even aware of it. But kind of astonishingly, it, it, that didn't work. Um, many, many, many months went by and we were doing everything that we could. Um, all three of us have pretty good networks and, and I, I know we got the podcast and a description of it to Samantha Power, who runs USAID, to her husband, who had been on Sam's podcast before, to a lot of people. But Ukraine was just starting to kick off. I guess that kind of explains it. But even so, it's like this is like a freaking asteroid heading toward our planet. I anyway, it, it was strange how little traction that we got. But finally, this summer, a whole bunch of things lined up. Um, started meeting one person who freaked out and introduced us to another and another, and some dominoes fell. And without going into a whole lot of detail, I'm pretty darn confident that Deep Vision will not pursue this catastrophic program. And that confidence is only a few weeks old, actually. Um, so this is sort of like that example, this terrifying example. I'm pretty sure we've stopped it. But this type of work is going on in a lot of places right now. And in fact, there's a larger arm of the United States government, the National Institutes of Health, that kind of wants to pick up the ball because we, <laughs> well, we made the, <laughs> we made the ball carrier fumble and, and now there's a risk that another US government arm that's got a lot more power than USAID might proceed with this work. It's crazy. Um, so next slide. Um, Let's assume, and I think we can, that Deep Vision doesn't do what we're worried about. Assuming no one else is doing something this insane, and we don't know about that, but let's assume that. Let's be optimistic. We should, in my view, and more importantly, in the view of people like Kevin Esfeld, who are actually scientists, that should give us five to seven years of runway before some inevitable improvements and in proliferation in the underlying science creates the kinds of dangers that deep vision threatens to accelerate. Let's go down two slides. This is one of those repeated slides. So what should we be doing? Well, as I'm sure you know, our COVID vaccines shattered all development speed records. For instance, Moderna shipped their vaccine literally, well, not literally, I mean, this is pretty impressive, but the, holy, the jaw dropper comes in a moment. They shipped their vaccine 342 days after China under significant pressure, finally released the genome of COVID to the rest of the world. That's an astounding timeline, which actually, but the important thing, it actually understates what Moderna pulled off by an enormous margin. Uh, next slide, please. Because this was a two-step process. Step one, the shot was developed. Then step two is that was testing and regulation. And unlike the segments on this slide, which I made 50-50, those steps were of highly unequal lengths. Specifically, next slide, please. Moderna literally needed just two days to develop its final COVID vaccine candidate, which hit the market almost a year later with initially 95% efficacy. In other words, testing and approval 
took up over 99% of the time. And that represents a vast opportunity, not just for regulators. Well, it, it just, let's just say this, it represents a vast opportunity for reasons that I'll get into. But first, next slide, please. The bad news, which is that we can't currently count on a two-day development cycle for the next pandemic. What I'm going to submit is we need to get ourselves into a situation where we can reliably count on two days or less for almost anything that nature or bad guys throw at us. But we can't currently count on that because an, another arm of the U.S. government, the U.S. government does great things as well, through sheer happenstance, had spent six years leading up to COVID deeply re researching a coronavirus called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And in that research, they were worried about MERS busting out as a pandemic. In that research, this US government arm focused heavily on the spike protein, which more blind luck here, is very similar to COVID's spike protein. So unbelievable coincidence and blessing, but also unbelievable technology. The unbelievable technology is only gonna get more and more unbelievable. That's great news. What we need to do is engineer our own luck on, on making sure that whatever comes down the pike, we've done the six years, the equivalent of six years of research on that. So uh, next slide. Um, let's see, I've gotten a little bit lost here. Sorry, I'm going backward on my own slides here. So anyway, that was the massive head start that Moderna and others leveraged. And ongoing blind luck obviously can't be our future pandemic strategy. So what we need is a lot of public and pri private finance to expand our defensive, what I'll call our defensive foreknowledge beyond a single family's most famous protein. And that's daunting, but surprisingly of the hundreds of known viral families, hundreds, and there's probably thousands out there, only 26 infect humans are on the slide. And that's not an intractably large number. And a head-on assault against this entire spectrum would cost about a billion dollars uh, per viral family, like about $26 billion spread over seven to 10 years. So a couple billion dollars a year. So society has to ask itself, is it worth spending two to $3 billion a year to collapse the vaccine path for any likely pandemic? And Obviously, I think the answer to that should be a resounding yes, and that's definitely within our means. That's basic science. Next slide. You know, particularly in light of these $16 trillion that COVID is estimated to be costing the U.S. economy alone, it's, and, you know, $45 billion or something north of that for the world economy, it's kind of hard to imagine an IQ test that would be easier to pass. But so far, next slide, please. We are flunking this IQ test because um, it, it is just astonishing how little public investment there has been um, in this. Like, basically, the Biden administration, when I went and gave the, the presentation there about a year ago, they were asking me to talk to, talk to them about this $60 billion proposal that they had made for pandemic preparedness. And it had a lot of great elements in it, including a near cousin to this one. But the US Congress didn't, couldn't be bothered to pass it. It is such a bizarre thing, but we can't give up. I mean, this is something that is definitely within reach of the science and is kind of a drop in the bucket when it comes to the public health benefit budgets of just the United States, let alone you know, the world combined. Um, so next slide. That's one thing we need to do is that basic science. Now, in addition to viral family research, we also need to pour resources into further advancing mRNA vaccine technology because it is really a truly profound breakthrough. And for all the vaccine hesitancies that, that's out there and so forth, um, nobody, it would be very hard to present an honest data set that estimates that the vaccines did anything other than save a stupefying number of lives. Um, so to be clear, less than two years after the first mRNA jabs were given, there is a lot of room for improvement here. And this is a place where entrepreneurs and investors have an enormous role to play because this is not, you know, governments don't start brilliant startups that create more and more new technology. And this is something that's really, really incumbent on the private sector. Um, next slide. 
We also, as, as we invest in this, this technology, yes, with some public funds, but hopefully with the private sector stepping up in a huge way, there is an urgent priority to collapse this time frame that we're depicting here. Um, why is my slide? Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, before something like this comes along, next slide, please. You guys are probably realizing um, the way that Michelle and I are synced up. I She's driving the slides and there's a good reason for that. I won't bore you with. Normally when I'm presenting live, I'm kind of like speaking and clicking. So sorry if it's there's a little bit of a lag here. It's um, Anyway, we need to really collapse this approval timeline and the distribution timeline, which I'll talk about in a second, because think of it you know, looting, blackouts, impending social collapse. And then everybody just sits tight for 300 days while the government goes through an approval cycle. We would be doomed, which means that we need to come together, public and private sec sector, to make all kinds of investments. Until we have enough conviction, we need as a society to get to a point of conviction about the effectiveness, dosing, and safety profile of a future day two vaccine candidate. And to be clear, I'm in no way suggesting that the Moderna or other vaccines should have been released on day two. That would have been lunacy because we didn't know anything about their safety or efficacy or dosing. But we are in a position now with that basis of knowledge and doing some of the basic science that I'm calling for to have incredibly high confidence in a day two vaccine, which even then we would not want to administer on day two unless it was a real crisis and we were facing you know, possible toppling of society. Um, so next slide, please. The goal would be something that regulators could sanely approve in days, not months. And that does sound preposterously ambitious, but exponential technologies deliver sudden outlandish results all the time. And this is an existential imperative in my view, because there's no stopping the proliferation of tools and techniques that will be existentially dangerous in the hands of careless people who routinely let dangerous pathogens escape from labs or reckless people who start mind spinning programs like Deep Vision or evil people like suicidal mass murderers or the person behind those anthrax attacks. Next slide, please. Now, there are countless pop problems for tiny private and giant public companies to tackle here, and also for the public sector as well. Like, how do we deal with mutagenesis and make vaccines increasingly robust against mutating variants? There's a lot of work to be done here. Or link vaccine development to the thousandfold improvements we're hoping to make in viral surveillance during via wastewater, public spaces, the air and diagnostics. There's lots of exciting work here happening and there's so much more that could be happening with just a tiny dollop of financing. And there's also, and, and these are just huge areas of opportunity. Next slide, please. And then there's a whole ecosystem to develop around mRNA vaccines, like something called adjuvants. Adjuvants are agents that are injected alongside traditional vaccines, active material, which can radically boost its power, which basically means you need radically less vaccine material, which is a big deal when you're in a production constrained environment, as we were when the vaccines were first released and many people had to wait months before they could get something that they wanted tomorrow. There are currently no native mRNA adjuvants, but researchers believe that good, that good ones could reduce the effective dose size by at least uh, two orders of magnitude, like drop it by 99%. And just think about how much more quickly you would have gotten your first COVID jab if the producers needed a hundredth as much product to vaccinate the country. So I think uh, there needs to be collaboration and very safe and sane level-headed collaboration on figuring out what advances and breakthroughs we need to make to make us confidently issue day two vaccines if it is an urgent situation and to confidently be able to produce a hundred times as many doses. It's a lot easier, I think, to find a great adjuvant that will enable that than to actually increase production um, by a hundred X. Um, now, the trouble is, next slide, even if we did have adjuvants, 
we could get jabs out a lot faster, but not a hundred times faster because it takes a lot of logistics to extend, to extend cold chains from a single point of production to tens of thousands of towns, which brings me to the next thing we urgently need to scale like mad before the careless or the reckless or the evil become truly dangerous, which is a highly distributed, which is highly distributed vaccine production. Um, I would say we have to scale this infinitely because it doesn't exist yet, but a kernel of it already is in production. So next slide, we're getting toward the end here. Um, and it looks like this, this is called the BioXP. It's the world's leading benchtop DNA printer. And today it can spin out 7,200 error corrected de novo synthetic base pairs of DNA, which is a lot, but not a ton, but it can be done in a laboratory. Not, it doesn't have to be done centrally at a lab, like at a central service bureau. That's a lot though. I mean, that's, it, it's getting there. It's about half of an influenza genome. And only a tiny minority of the researchers who work with nucleic acid could build something that long in their labs. And those who can hardly ever bother because they want these long strands for experiments or products that are way more interesting than connecting base pairs all day. So next slide. So currently almost all the long DNA strands out there are ordered from scientific suppliers with specialized tools and techniques that allow them to crank out these long strands of nucleic acid and ship them overnight. But the future is distributed. And just as text messages replace telegraph offices and smartphones replace photo labs, almost any synthetic DNA will eventually be made at the point of use by benchtop printers, whose speed, pricing, and accuracy will constantly improve. Until one day, a biology undergrad will have a viable replicating virus shortly after downloading a simple text file containing its genome, which is another reason why deep vision is such a bad idea. But next slide. But the descendants of this device, they could be very dangerous unless we harden them up in ways that we can talk about in the Q&A. They could also play a game-changing protective role for us. In fact, the BioXP product line which currently dominates benchtop DNA synthesis is being developed for literally the express purpose of teleporting vaccines. So those are the exact words of its inventor, Dan Gibson. He developed this to one day teleport vaccines. The idea is instead of making billions of doses in Cambridge, which is where Moderna made their doses and then calling FedEx, next slide, we could have bioprinters making vaccines on demand in every pharmacy, doctor's office, and hospital. Vaccine production at the edge. Now, those machines will have to do a hell of a lot more than today's BioXP because there's way more to making a vaccine dose than spitting out a, a, strand, a, a strand of RNA. But there's an exponential wave to ride here. And Dan Gibson is not a science fiction writer. That would be Will Gibson, who's a great science fiction writer. Dan is a le legendary and very level-headed scientist who also invented something called the Gibson Assembly Protocol, which is a molecular pro cloning procedure that is basically almost universally used in synthetic biology. This is a very credible person. Next slide. Um, Dan told me that he expects to ship vaccine-ready units to businesses within three to five years. And as a long-term entrepreneur myself, I knew that we simply have to take the long end of any range and double it to get to an, an accurate estimate. So next slide. So let's say we could have a 1.0 international, well, national networks and hopefully international linking our pharmacies in 10 years. Back of the envelope, after doubling the ugly end of at least one other range, the cost of this pencils out to mid tens of billions of dollars for the US, 300 million people, and we can extrapolate that to other countries spread over a decade. Again, that sounds like a lot of money, but you spread it over a decade and you compare it to public health benefits or just internet government benefits. Um, that's something we can sanely afford to make. In fact, I don't know how we could sanely afford not to make that investment. Um, so last slide, but we only have so much runway. So we need visionary national leadership calling for this and flooding labs and companies in this space with funding and incentives, and also entrepreneurs and investors to shift into high gear and do the heavy lifting. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. Just one final wrap up. One of the things that really intrigues me about New Zealand is, well, it's obviously a smaller market than the United States, and it's, it's not the, as large of a nexus of synthetic biology development. Um, it has, such an efficient and sane government. 
that certain policy innovations, not everything that I talked about, but certain policy innovations, I could see them happening much more rapidly in New Zealand than they would ever happen in the US or most countries. And after setting a precedent, you know, I think a lot of people looked to New Zealand as a place that got a lot of stuff right over the last few years. With that precedent, um, I think that there could be a really extraordinary potential basically for New Zealand to lead the world in taking some of the measures that we need to do take to really prevent the next pandemic that we're unfortunately not taking yet. So I went a little longer than I thought. I'm sorry, I, I've got less Q&A time, but I'm I'm happy to stick around. Oh my yeah. God, Rob, thank you. That was so cool. So, oh my gosh, any questions, please put your hands up. But I'm kind of like, how do we get one of those printers, those teleporters to come here to New Zealand? And uh, <laughs> how can you then, What do you know whether uh, New Zealand is, you know, sort of connected into these conversations that's happening up into the US? I, I, you know, I don't know. And when I come down there for my welcome session, probably in March, but definitely in May, if not March, obviously, uh, I really do want to, you know, hopefully with EHF's help, I really would like to do some networking with the government down there and talk to some people in public health and get a sense for just where the thinking is right now and what the connections are. Um, part of this, I, I, I would say probably to some degree, because um, the people that I presented to in the White House were the top folks in, in biosecurity in the US. And a lot of this is being viewed through a security lens. And New Zealand is one of the so-called five eyes, which is US, Canada, UK, New Zealand, Australia. And there's more intelligence sharing between these five countries than probably any other set of countries in the world. So my guess is there is a lot, there are certain people inside the New Zealand government who are profoundly wise about this and are profoundly influential with their peers in the other other four countries. Mm. Nice. Any questions for Rob or any reflections anyone has? Well, first of all, wow, um, <laughs> quite an eye opener. And just on like the deep vision part of preventing some things that are spinning up this scenario <laughs> that you, you know, eloquently outline the the unintended consequences um yeah. what's, what's kind of your take on what it would take around that specific one plus just other vectors that might get started on something similar yeah um because it almost makes me feel like uh civilization is a sand a tibetan sand painting where you know with this type of exponentials around synthetic biology yeah yeah, we can't overstate how destabilizing it is. And so uh, I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, we basically ended up with this little ad hoc sort of Scooby-Doo gang of people, all of us from civil society, although um, we were made aware of the danger of this program from somebody very, very, very senior in the U.S. security apparatus, somebody who thought he'd be able to shut this down and wasn't able to. So he said, you know, we need civil society to engage and put a spotlight on it and start doing some lobbying and some networking. And so this little ad hoc group of us, um, and I was more the early dominoes and other people were more the later dominoes, seem to have prevailed. So I, I think there's a really important lesson there about how valuable open societies are. I, I think if we were living in an autocracy here, um, raising the, a peep, let alone a chorus of peeps, a thunderous chorus of peeps like this would have landed us in horrible places. So, um, so I think those of us who are in open societies need to watch this space very, very, very carefully. What needs to happen in, when our little Scooby-Doo gang talks about what's next, um, we feel like there's three steps. Step one, stop division. Um, and they're all pretty hard. And having done that, the next step is much harder, but having done step one, you got some momentum and, and some stuff you can point to. So step two is I think at least here in the US, and this is where I think New Zealand could have incredible leadership. We need a very thoughtful de facto national ban on this type of activity. Say so it's not permitted. That stops the National Institutes from, of Health from doing it again. And we also need to say, not that there's a lot of private sector incentive to do this kind of work, but also say, illegal in the private sector too. And there's a bunch of other policy decisions that if made would put very significant speed bumps in front of things spinning out of control. 
This common sense set of policies could certainly be passed in New Zealand as well. And in some cases, it might seem symbolic because maybe certain aspects of Synbio industry don't exist in New Zealand, but it would not be missed. It would be an astonishingly powerful precedent. So I think the next step would be national ban somewhere respected. And then the evangelization, and, and that was a thunderclap. That is a really sensible country has banned this. And now it's not just a podcaster waving his hands at the PowerPoint. It is a nation of this earth that has adopted this set of rules, which are very pro-science, but very pro-humanity. And then the evangelization of that on an international level. There are examples of this working. I mean, the Montreal Protocol, we have ozone because of that. The um, nuclear test ban treaty for all of the scary leakages that we've had with nuclear proliferation, pretty amazing how effective that has been. And some people are like, wait, we need to be doing this full, you know, full throttle because otherwise North Korea and China are going to do it. And that's a scary thought. But what's interesting here is I think it's even easier to make the case to, uh, let's say, a, a China, that this is not in your interest that this work happen, even in your own country. It's easier to make that case with, with this than it was with nuclear weapons. And, and the reason is that Fort Detrick example. Um, if we in China secretively did crazy stuff like this, it's not like only Xi Jinping and Biden would have the blinking red button. Basically, anybody working in those labs would. And I think if we if that story is told very carefully and correctly, the realization would seep in, like literally nobody has more to lose from this stuff happening than China and the United States, because we have the biggest slices of the world economy, and in China's case, the big, biggest slice of the, of the population, I think the story could be told in a way that the world's governments would all say, Jesus Christ, we don't even want to do this. Because look at, look at Fort Detrick and many, many other examples. So it's got to be that. It's got to be stop this program, step two, national ban, step three, evangelize national ban. And that's kind of my public service agenda for the next 25 years. Um, I'm going to stay very engaged in this, uh, even though it, it takes a lot of time away from a day job. It's, it's, um, it's important and it's really, really, really interesting. And people are starting to listen. Yeah, this makes me think of, uh, you know, when Jeff uh, with Larry Brilliant created the Global Threats Fund to look at these, mm -hmm. you know, 10 that were not necessarily on the radar, but if they happen, they take out everything else. And this feels yeah. like uh, at the top of that list. Larry is a neighbor here in Mill Valley. And um, I, I think that that conversation actually spun up at the, at the TED conference. And my business partner, my fund is Chris Anderson, who runs the TED conference and first gave Larry his, his TED wish, which connected him with Google. And so, yeah. Larry is a very important person in this conversation. I'm not going to identify the other people in my Scooby-Doo gang, though. <laughs> yeah, I was working with Chris when he bought the TED conference for the Sapling Foundation. And then oh, I really? helped, uh, helped prototype the TEDx movement and so on. What? So, uh, yeah. Were you at Future Publishing? Yes. or? Yeah, I was, oh, I, was the venture, I was the venture catalyst with Chris. Um, and then often people think Chris really gets a lot done because they're the two Chris is Chris Anderson's the maker. Yeah, yeah, uh, Chris yeah. Anderson as well, but yeah. So I, I talked Chris into spinning out IGN, um, and I was the first wow. board member of of outside board member of IGN. Uh, that this is way, way, way back ago. So I've been friends with Chris since future days as well, and I'm sure we probably passed each other in a hallway. That's really cool. That's really, yeah, was, really cool. Was, uh, at school, school with uh, Jeff Skoll as well, and then I also wow. remember sort of Rhapsody and Listen.com and all of all of the yeah, that was like my that. thing. So brings back a lot of memories. Well, well, Chris and I talk two or three times a week, so I'm going to drop your name. We're we're going to be speaking in a couple of days. I'm definitely going to drop your name. This is so cool. Great, well, don't you love it? Connections from the other side of the world, nice. Indeed. Any other questions for Rob? Otherwise, I'm conscious we're getting closer to the hour. Janine, you've un unmuted. You just wanted to say hi. I just wanted to, first of all, thank you very much, Rob. That was just mm -hmm. so enlightening. Um, yes, I mean, I think the whole thing about shortening approval time of vaccinations is a very um, interesting one because there are 
strong pros and strong there are. Um, antis. And so, you know, I'm the jury is out on that as far as I'm concerned. But um, it's just very, very important that we know about this. So thank you so much. Mm. Yeah, we my and my point on that is we need to make the investments in science and public health the necessary investments to be able to do that responsibly and with confidence. We mm. we we can't do that now. We should not do that now. But there are there are very, very, very plausible advances that could be made mm-hmm. if we make the right investments that would put us in that position. But I agree with you on, on its face. No, let's not do that this year. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get this work done. So when we don't know when the next one's coming, let's no. let's use the runway we've got to be as close to in that position, ideally in that position when the time comes, because we are never going to know when the time comes until it's about three weeks too late. Nice. Well, thank you. If there's no other questions, Adele, did you want to say anything? Could you? Yep. Go, mate. Hi, Rob. Thanks for the awesome presentation. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Todd. I saw you. Thank you, Chuck. So I was just listening. Um, got a quick question for you, Rob. Mm-hmm. Um, the the Christopher the Christopher DNA modification is uh, technology is kind of become mature now. Feels like people can literally change many things and starting to understand a bit more about the DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you played with the chatbot that we had on OpenAI with that GPT-3. Wait, um, are you at OpenAI? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, drops it again. Uh, are you at OpenAI? No, I am not. I, I mm. wish, but I do contribute to that repo um, mm. with a bit, a bit more documentation or algorithm. Mm. <laughs> um, oh no, I've so, been having, I've been blown away by it. I've, I've lost many hours to it this past weekend. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's awesome, isn't it? So since the AI is kind of becoming mature now, as long as you feed information to it, it will be able to pick up some key information based on the stuff that you feed into. So now there's Christopher, do you know of any organizations that actually are linking these two things together to kind of fix the crisis that you are referring to in your presentation? Yeah, there, unfortunately, there's a very interesting, uh, I'll get to the unfortunate part in a moment. There's a really interesting and important project called Secure DNA, um, which would leverage um, basically, I mean, AI and a lot of other technologies and a really profound understanding of uh, genomic sequencing and synthesis. And the objective of Secure DNA is to create a system whereby any DNA printer, and at this moment, DNA printers, simple press and print printers are not yet capable of generating viruses the day that they are um millions of, of people in in undergraduate labs will have access to them before that day comes we want a layer called secure dna which will basically be a screening system whereby if somebody is hitting print on something that is dangerous um it will be flagged it will be speed bumped it will not print unless there is a very good reason for it to print and there's elements of secure dna that that are sort of semi-anonymized and 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 secured in a way that will give um you know users a little bit more you know less worry about being deeply surveilled it's a great great system and it builds on something that's already happening there's a group called the Inter- international genome uh synthesis consortium igsc i had that slide with the sort of central service bureaus that make dna most of the biggies in that domain are part of igsc and if you're an igsc member they are a part of, they have a voluntary self-regulating scheme whereby they don't print dangerous DNA for somebody who shouldn't have it. And they've developed this system over 15 years and it's very forward looking. Secure DNA would be a big, big improvement on that. I say, unfortunately, um, the guy, Kevin Esfeld, who I interviewed for that, that interview that set off this whole deep vision thing, he's sort of the brain father of it. And he confidently told me early on, it's like, yeah, yeah, we got all the funding we need for this. And um, uh, when I asked him several months ago, where's it coming from? He's like, well, there's this, there's this amazing philanthropy arm attached to uh, a company called FTX, 
and um, its founder is really into uh, you know, effective altruism. So, you know, for all of the badness it brought into the world, FTX um, was really serious about pandemic resilience. And they they made a lot of donations, substantial ones. So things they were kind of filling in to some degree for the freaking governments. And that funding source is clearly dried up right now. Um, but I think we'll find other ones. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the short right. answer is no. Thank you. It's under development. It's under development. Yeah, but really Tom, freaking smart people are working, but it's not it's not shipping yet. So thanks, Tom. Thank, thank you. Okay, team, I'm conscious that we're just over the hour. So um, if you want to have conversations with Rob, feel free to have them um, offline or at another time. And Rob did say he will share his presentation. Um, and mm -hmm. even I think you said the one with the notes. I've currently got the one without the notes. So that is there available. And the, oh, no, the one that I sent you, didn't, didn't the PowerPoint that I sent you have notes in it? I don't think so. It's okay. I'll have a look at it afterwards. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, and, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll share with anybody for sure. Yeah, great. And I'll just, I'll just stop this so I can.